We've been discussing domain and range this whole time in our conversation about functions, but now we're going to give them official names and explain to you in greater detail what is going on. So, the domain is all of the x values of a function, and the range is all of the y values of a function. Now, of course, we don't use y with functions. We refer to it more as f of x or g of x. In other words, all of the inputs that we've ever put into a function result in outputs. Therefore, every domain has a unique range or unique output. So if I plug in a 0, I get a 0. If I plug in a 2, I get a 4, etc. And what a function has been all along is a model that takes an input and gives an output. In other words, a function that ha has a domain and a range. So for part A, we say that this function has a domain as follows. This is known as set notation. These are little brackets. And this represents all the inputs in this order. For part B, we say the range, again in set notation, is going to be the y value, so 0, 4, 4, 9. Even if there is repetition, we go ahead and write them out. We have to ask ourselves, if I were to plug in a 0, I'm going to get a 0. If I plug in a 2, I get a 4. If I plug in a negative 2, I get a 4. If I plug in a 3, I get a 9. So what function, if I give it these inputs, gives me this output? May I propose the simple quadratic x squared? Check it. If I plug in a 0, do I get a 0? If I plug in a negative 2, so we use parentheses, right, to substitute the input in. If I plug in a negative 2 in here, that means the entire quantity is squared. So that's negative 2 times negative 2. And that's a positive for output. So if I plug in a domain of negative 2, I get a range of 4. It is always well to check all of the options. Make sure that each of these inputs gives me these outputs based on this function that we created for part C. And it checks out. Part D, let's go ahead and graph this. So remember, these are your x values and these are your y values. Here's the first point, 0, 0. Here's the next point, 2, comma, 4. Here's the third point, negative 2, comma, 4. Here's the final point, 3, comma, 9. If we connect those, we're going to get this graph. This is called a parabola. And this is the graph of a quadratic. So this is the graph, part D, of the function that we came up with in part C based on the domain and range from parts A and B. Does this graph have a maximum or a minimum? Some functions may have both. Some of them, uh, as you learn in calculus, will have relative minimum or maximum. We're going to look at general in this case. And you'll notice that if I'm a skateboarder and I'm going down this ramp, I'm going to get really fast down here and then it's going to go ahead and slow down as I go further up again. But I do hit a minimum point right here. So anytime there's something of a ball, or a valley, it's a minimum. So for example, if I'm looking at this region right here, for this graph, you'll know there's a minimum right here because it's a bowl or a valley. However, if I'm looking at this region right here, you'll know there's a maximum because there's a hill. So for a graph like this, for example, we have a maximum right here because it's a hill. There are more mathematical ways to find out if a point is a maximum or a minimum. In this class, we're going to just focus on visuals. Part F, we have intervals where there's increasing and decreasing behavior. So, for example, based on this minimum right here, you see the arrows are going in this direction. So it's increasing and increasing. However, if you have to be the skateboarder right in this parabola, you may consider that as you get closer to this point right here, the, the minimum, 
you may consider this possibly decreasing. So to answer this question, it actually depends on how you want to perceive this. But in general, um, we have areas of increasing in both directions that are going up to the y-axis forever. Let's switch the columns in the above table and regraph. So in other words, we're working with this now. So we're going to go ahead and graph this. Here's our x and f of x graph. We begin with our first point, 0, 0. Next is 4, comma 2. Then it's 4, comma negative 2. And then it's 9, comma 3. And now we connect those. We have a parabola once again, except it's kind of on its side. Now, why is this the case? It's because we switch the domain with the range. This is technically called the inverse. We get the inverse when we switch the inputs with the outputs. Remember how with the inverse, we go ahead and switch the x with the y and solve for y? That's what's happening here. We're switching the x with the y. We're switching the x with the f of x. We're switching the input with the output. We're switching the domain with the range. And so what we get is we get the same exact graph, except it's on its side. So for a, a better visual contrast, here is our original function, right? f of x equals x squared. This is what the original domain did, the original range. Here is the quote-unquote inverse that we graphed, right? What we did was take the table that we were given originally. We switched the input with the output. We switched the domain and the range. We just switched the x and the y, and then we graphed it. And this is what we got. Here's both of the graphs on the same graph, the original with the switched. And then here is the mirror, right? The line of reflection. We made a big deal last time with the last topic of inverses that if it is an inverse graphically, you're going to see that reflection about this mirror, about this fx equals x. And so we see that. We see that these are reflections of each other. We have the original graph. We have the inverse graph. There you go. Problem two. So this time they actually gave us a function. This is our function. We want to know what the range is if the domain is this. So this is the domain. Again, we're using that set notation with the brackets. And we want to find out what the range is. So if I were to plug in a 3 into this function, we have this set up, which simplifies to this, which gives me 3. So the 3 in this domain corresponds to a 3 in this range. If I plug in a 4, I get a 10. If I plug in a 5, I get a 19. So again, this is stuff that we've been doing for the last 3, 4 weeks. Put in the input, get an output, plug in the domain, get the range. Again, note how each domain gives us a specific numerical range.